Okay, so I want to welcome everybody uh, tonight. Uh, we're glad to have uh, Scott uh, Salmon, a partner with the firm, um, Jardine, Meisner, and Susser in Florham Park uh, joining us. And he is an attorney with a wide range of experience in general civil litigation, employment law, election law, and governmental representation. The theme for tonight is voter progression, suppression, and regression in New Jersey. So I'll just give you a little uh, background on uh, Scott and then Scott will take it away and then we'll have time for questions and answers. Scott has handled complex matters involving employment discrimination, including discrimination based upon gender, race, national origin, sexual orientation, religion, age, and disability, and wrongful termination. Scott has also advised and represented multiple local and congressional political campaigns on various election related issues, including ballot access, canvassing, advertisements, and recounts. Scott advises organizations such as 501c4 entities and public action committees, uh, commonly, commonly referred to as PACs, on campaign finance rules and regulations. He has served as general counsel to a successful campaign for the U.S. House of Representatives. Uh, he has secured favorable results for a whistleblower client who was terminated for reporting illegal activity to their superiors. Uh, he has secured favorable results for sexual harassment and assault victim asserting claims against a large public institution. <clears throat> Scott is an Eagle Scout, has run three marathons, and is a devout fan of the New York Jets. Well, there's a lot going for him, but uh, we won't do that against him. <laughs> Our rabbi is a devout uh, Jets fan also. Nice to meet you. Scott has earned his uh, JD degree from uh, Washington Lee University School of Law. And I want to, on behalf of Temple Israel, thank Scott for taking the time to join us. And uh, Scott, take it uh, from here, please. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you all um, for, thank you for inviting me. Thank you for jumping, joining. Uh, joining. Um, I'm gonna uh, share my screen so you can see a little PowerPoint that I put together. Graduates. Um, okay. okay, you can all see now. Okay, you guys, someone give me a thumbs up if you can see the, see the screen. Good, okay. Okay, so um, I'm going to try and take you through New Jersey and voting rights, voter suppression, uh, some of the good things that New Jersey does, one particularly bad thing that New Jersey does, um, and then I'll, we'll open up the questions after uh, about this or about, about anything. Um, let's, start, let's start with the good, um, what the good things that New Jersey has done or and is doing. Um, I want to go back to the very beginning when New Jersey was first founded uh, as a state. Um, the original constitution uh, for New Jersey back in 1776, it was, I believe, the only state that, uh, that uh, uh, allowed women, uh, uh, well, I should say certain women, you couldn't be married um, uh, because if you're married, you couldn't own property. Uh, you had to be a property owning uh, individual to, to vote. But if you were a, a freed um, black person or uh, a, uh, a property owning woman, you were able to vote. Okay, so we were the only state that was allowed to do that. Um, uh, yeah. Okay. This, it was such a big thing. Uh, I'll say that Abigail Adams, I'm just a quote up here from her, this is from a letter that she wrote back in 1797, said if our state, if our, or meaning Massachusetts, state constitution had been equally liberal that in Jersey and admitted the females to a vote, then she would have certainly exercised it. Um, so it was known, New Jersey was known for being called ahead of the times uh, in terms of voting rights, voting, voting access. Uh, to people, that. at least temporarily, at least at the beginning. There was a step back uh, in between 1802, uh, 1802, 1806. There were a lot of uh, accusations, complaints about voter fraud. Uh, it's not, that's certainly not a new issue. Uh, it goes back to the beginning of voting itself. Uh, but there were claims that of voter fraud by uh, immigrants, people who were, who were enslaved, married women who, like I said, couldn't own property and therefore were not able to vote. And specifically, there were claims of voter fraud by uh, by the residents of, uh, of Philadelphia, which is apparently the was apparently the worst of all of those things. Um, again, as a Jets fan, I can sympathize with against Eagles fans. Um, 
So in 1807, they restricted them the right to vote again to uh, white uh, land owning men, um, at least I guess, temporarily until the 15th Amendment was passed in 1870, which opened it up to, uh, to uh, people of other races, as well as uh, in 1919 by the 19th Amendment as to gender effect and to, and to women. Um, just because you guys are in, in Bergen County, um, I want to give you the example, uh, a, a somewhat famous example from Elizabeth Cady Stanton, uh, tried to vote in Tenafly in, in 1880, which was with Susan B. Anthony, and she was told that there was no, no such precedent of women voting, uh, and therefore she was not allowed to vote. Um, she knew her history and was able to respond and say that, you know, in New Jersey, we, we did allow this from 1776 to, to 1807. Um, so she still wasn't she still wasn't allowed to vote, but at least no, at least she knew her knew her history. Um, vote by mail in the last few years uh, has become a lot more popular. It's become a lot more well known. It used to be known as absentee voting. Uh, New, uh, New Jersey's history with it goes back to 1815 uh, when they began allowing members of the military to vote using an absentee ballot. It had to be at war, out of state at the time of the election. But they were able to vote vote by mail. Um, that only lasted for about five years. Um, I didn't include it in this in this presentation, but actually, most states in the country started allowing absentee voting uh, on a widespread basis, or at least among the military during the Civil War. Uh, New Jersey was not one of those states because at the time, um, uh, New Jersey was a it was a Democratic state, and the, and the, and the Democrats were didn't want Abraham Lincoln to, and to get as many votes. And so they weren't uh, supportive of, of absentee voting at that point. Um, but a couple of years later, uh, after the war was over in 1876, they reinstituted it again, only for members of the military um, who, uh, who had to be at war at the time. Um, this was eventually expanded in 1953 to allow anybody to, uh, to um, vote, by uh, vote by mail using absentee ballots. Uh, provided that they had to give a one of a defined re one defined reason as to why they weren't available to vote. For the most people, it was just that they were out of state um, and could not could not physically get to the polls on election day. In 2009, only just a couple of years ago, uh, New Jersey completely overhauled the law and they changed the term from absentee voting to voting by mail. Um, which the key difference between them is you don't have to be absent. Uh, to, to, to use a mail-in ballot now. Um, you, you, don't, you don't have to give any reason. You can be at home and be able to go to the, um, go to the polls if you want to, but you, uh, you just choose not to, and that's, that's good enough to get, uh, to get a mail-in ballot now. Um, most recently, this uh, has been expanded even further, so any voter can request a mail-in ballot and that they will, they will now be automatically sent to them indefinitely for as long as you want for every election going forward until you tell the, your county board of elections otherwise. Um, so that every single election you can, in a sense, it makes it easier not to, not to miss any election because every ballot is gonna be sent directly to your home. So that was a big, big advancement, that, uh, advancement that we made back in 2018 to open up the polls uh, to more people. There have been a lot, there are a lot of other things that are going on a lot, of, especially re, uh, recently in the past few years. Um, you know, when you mail in a ballot, uh, when you're mailing back a ballot, you have to pay for postage, uh, which isn't a whole lot of money, it's just the cost of a stamp. Um, but for some, for some people, that's, that's just too much money. And so uh, uh, now count a lot of counties, although not all of them are offering prepaid postage for ballots. So you just need to drop it off in the, uh, at, at any uh, mailbox and it will get back, get it, make its way back to the uh, Board of Elections. Um, in the last election, we started seeing drop boxes for mail-in ballots as well. So you don't just have to rely on the postal service. You can go to uh, one, of, one of the drop boxes that's available. That's something that's gonna continue uh, going forward in, in all future elections. Um, they're actually gonna be, the boards of election are gonna be given additional authority to choose, to pick and choose where exactly they're gonna go, the, the drop boxes will go. Uh, in the last election, they were fairly limited, both in how many they can have and where they had to be. And so you, there were a lot of places that were um, for, let it back, for lack of a better phrase, disenfranchised in that they, they, they didn't have any drop boxes uh, close to them, whereas some other places had multiple drop boxes within their towns. Um, so it's, th those will be spread out better going forward. Um, we're also going to see more 
or I should say increased access to early voting using voting machines uh, starting in this in this upcoming uh, election in November. Um, before previously, if you want to vote early, your only option was to vote by mail. You could go to a board or go to the county clerk and get and pick up a mail in ballot, fill it out there and just go down to the board of elections and hand it over to them. Um, now they're going to be uh, expanding access uh, in the weeks leading up to election day. Um, through, you know, at certain times, certain locations, you're going to be able to go and cast a vote on an actual voting machine before election day if, if you want to do that. Um, so this is going to be the first year that, that New Jersey is going to see that. Um, since 2012, when they, when they started changing the law on this, there has been a trend to consolidate elections in New Jersey. Um, previously, and still in, in a few places, I think we're down to about 12 now, uh, 12, uh, 12 towns. They have school board elections in April, municipal elections in May, they have the primary in June, and they have a general election in, uh, in November. Uh, Ridgewood, which you guys are from, at least the synagogue is, uh, was one of those towns. Um, I represented a group. Uh, uh, Matt uh, Matt Lindenberg was uh, was one of the one of the group that um, got a public uh, question put on the ballot that consolidated the elections, and so now they're just the primary elections in June and the general election in November. So that you you also have the school board and the municipal elections in November as well. The there are a lot of different benefits to it. One is that it doesn't cost towns as much money to uh, hold all these extra elections. But two, and uh, arguably more importantly, is it increases voter turnout. Um, but, but when you have four separate elections that people need to go to, uh, you don't have very many people voting in them. And so by consolidating them, more people are, are able to, to vote. Um, there, I know it's going to, it, there are groups in, I believe, in Tenafly and, Mont and Montclair, and I want to say Hammond Town, something in, in South Jersey. That are also likely going to be putting this question on the ballot uh, this coming November. So, in a in a year or two, I'm going to guess, or in a couple of years, that we're going to be down to having gotten rid of the uh, school board elections in April and the main municipal elections. So that's that's a good thing for, for voter turnout. Now I want to talk about the bad. Um, in particular, there's one one bad thing that I, that I'm, I want to talk about. Uh, something that's called the the county line. Uh, New Jersey has, as, I, as you can imagine from what I was just describing, some of the most voter friendly laws in the country. But despite that, most elections are pretty meaningless. They're meaningless in the sense of you don't have a real choice. You may have noticed this when you go to the when you go to vote in, a, in, let, in let's say a primary election, uh, and there's only one person to vote for. Or if you're voting for, let's say, your county commissioners. There are only there are three seats that are open and three candidates. Same same with school board races. That is the vast majority of races in New, in New Jersey. Um, this is mostly because of how our ballots are designed, and we're, we're going to get into the, uh, some of the details of this in a minute. Uh, but the the way the ballots are designed creates something that's called the county line. Um, I, in my opinion, this is probably one of the most the purest forms of voter suppression, because you're if if you're if the candidates don't matter, your votes don't matter, the results have already been decided because whoever it is that appears on the ballot, that's who you're gonna get elected. And so this is a really important thing to understand if you wanna understand all, all, all the biggest problem facing uh, voters and voter suppression in, in New Jersey. Before we get into what the county line is though, because I know that's, that's the phrase, I wanna explain what I mean by that. Before I get into that, I wanna go back into history a little bit uh, and explain how we, how we got this because that's it's critical to understanding how we got here to understand what it, what the situation is now. Um, so you go way back before 1789, back when the country was first founded, there were still local elections, um, but there were no statewide political parties. You just had groups of people who would choose amongst themselves. This is who I want to uh, want to represent us in our you know let's say our town council, um, and you'd have a couple of those groups that would put someone up. And that was your election uh, in November. After 1798 or 1789, political parties started to form uh, and they started holding conventions to select the candidates who would appear on the ballot. By conventions, I really mean it's the party boss, whoever was in charge of the, uh, the party and could gather the most number of voters. They were the ones who picked who, whatever, like the Whig party was gonna put up in, uh, in November. Um, 
until and so for almost 100 years until 1878 there was absolutely no state regulation over these political parties how they were able to nominate people what the elections looked like um there were there were no primary elections uh, it was just there was just a general election um so in starting in 1878 there started to be a few regulations on how these conventions had to be for, had, had to had to happen there were some rules put in place to make sure that it wasn't really just the one person, the one party boss choosing, that it was actually the members of the political party that had some sort of say in 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 how in how uh, who they were going to nominate. Um, in 1903 was when New Jersey adopted what's called the direct primary system, which is the each party has a formal process, a formal primary election, which it chooses who their representative is going to be on in the November election. And this is setting aside, you know, uh, an independent candidate or anything like that. So, primarily Democrats and Republicans, although you know, other parties can can use a similar process too. Um, it was meant. It was, this was the age of progressivism. Woodrow Wilson was about to become, uh, be, um, become the governor. The the uh, this was meant to curb the influence of party bosses and the political machines. If you've ever seen Boardwalk Empire, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, New Jersey is kind of famous for its political corruption and uh, its party bo and party bosses. And so this was meant to sort of stymie their influence a little bit uh, by by putting a process in place to allow people specifically other than the party boss to choose who the nominees were going to be. That's that's at least the theory behind it. So in 1903, we enacted this law, which standardized primary elections. It, I should say it created primary elections. We, we just didn't have them before. Uh, so by doing that, we uh, decided that the state was going to now pay for them as taxpayer funds, where there were going to be requirements for what the ballots had to look like. There were uh, more requirements for party for regis registering as a member of political parties. This is really when they uh, started creating uniform uh, uh, polling booths. Beforehand, it was very common. I say it was common for um, uh, in elections, you would just go up to your polling location with a sheet of paper that had the name of the candidate that you wanted on there. That name was given to you, or the sheet of paper where the name was given to you by your local party boss. Uh, and you would just hand in that sheet of paper and that was how you voted. Um, this created really what po the polling was close to what we know now. Um, in 1911, uh, Woodrow Wilson, uh, who was uh, against the party bosses, uh, passed this law called again, the Grant Act, uh, which was meant specifically to break up the party machines. Um, and so create additional additional uh, uh, regulations and instituted a signature requirement. That way, you know, you couldn't, I mean, they literally used to pay the homeless to, to go in and steal voters' identities and sign for them and, and vote on other people's behalf. Um, not just the homeless, but that's, that there are famous examples of that. Um, and so that was, that was the beginning of, I'll call it the, the modern system that we know it. After that, starting really in, in the early 1900s, specifically around 1923, the they were they the state decided that they want to put additional restrictions on the political parties and how they had were going to operate. Again, this is all meant to limit the influence of the uh, uh, of the, the political bosses by forcing them to have actual organizations of other people whose input was supposed to be involved in this. So they create what's called the what's called what are called county committees. County committees are, are then subdivided into municipal committees. As you can imagine, each municipality has its own uh, municipal committee. Both Democrats and Republicans each have their own. Um, the, the county committees and the municipal committees are comprised of what are called county committee members, uh, which is the lowest form of elected office in New Jersey. Um, the, there are two from every election district in the state. Um, and so it typically, well, historically, a male and a female, although a couple of years ago, that was ruled as as unconstitutional. Um, although, but in most places, it still is a man, a man and a woman. Um, two from each election district, which is usually your block and maybe two other blocks in in your town, and that's really it. So, it's a, just like I said, the smallest unit of, uh, of elected office in the state. Um, I live in Springfield, New Jersey. We have about forty something uh, uh, members. Town nearby, Garwood, has four. Uh, members of its of its committee. I'm not sure how many Ridgewood has, but there are there are some uh, some places that have in the hundreds, uh, based on you know based on population. The bigger the town, the more election districts you have, the bigger your 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 committee is going to be. Those uh, county committee members come together and they have their own bylaws. 
an organization and they elect whoever their county chair is going to be. They elect the municipal chair and they create the structure by which their local party is going to operate. Okay. This is important because there was a law passed back again in the, in the 20s created uh, called the, the Bracketing and Ballot Placement Law. law. I, am a, I am a lawyer who specifically does election law and I do not fully understand this law. It is the most convoluted, arcane, and insane law I've ever seen. It's one paragraph, which is really one long sentence that frankly doesn't make very much sense, uh, like gram any grammatical sense, much less legal sense. Um, but what it does is it creates this system where you have countywide candidates who are typically your, now we call them county commissioners, they used to be the, the board of chosen freeholders, um, who file a petition to run together as a slate, and they request to run under a common slogan. So we're, I'm going to go over some examples in a minute. I'm from Union County, so if you're a Democrat running in Union County, you want to request the slogan of the regular Democratic organization um, of Union County. Um, there are other every county, every political party, uh, every party within each county has its own slogan, um, and and you can request to all have the same slogan. Now, if you're part of that county slate, that's great that you have the same slogan because by having the same slogan, that means that you're going to be physically placed together on the ballot itself. So it's gonna list candidate A, B, and C, the regular democratic or, uh, organization of, of Union County, and it's gonna say that next to them. Any other candidates, so whether you're running for governor, state senator, president, local municipal office, if you want to run on, uh, run on the same ticket with those people, you would then have to request to have the same slogan as those candidates. And if you will have that same slogan, you will again be physically placed, your name will be placed alongside those other names. If you request that and to use that same slogan, the county clerk then goes to that joint ticket and says, hey, Scott Salmon wants to run on your ticket with you and use the same slogan, does he have your permission to do so? Under this law, that request specifically goes to the campaign manager of that, that countywide slate. So it's the, the in, for all intents and purposes, it's the campaign manager that's chosen by the, can, the, by the county party to represent the county's uh, candidates. So it's the county, uh, the county committee that's, that's deciding who gets the county uh, slogan or what's called the county line. Uh, these, the benefit of being on the county line is you get preferential, again, under this law, you get preferential treatment on the ballot, which means your name gets placed first. If you don't have, if you have any other slogan or don't have a slogan that's not the county's slogan, you get placed in what's called ballot Siberia, which we're going to talk about in a second. Uh, but it means that you get placed far away from everyone else. Um, so you may see uh, Joe Biden or Donald Trump uh, uh, at, the, uh, at, the top of, at the top of the line. Uh, and then all of, a bunch of other candidates, and you may see Phil Murphy um, or, or someone else, and then you see all the other candidates, and then you'll see someone else, some other random name on the opposite side of the ballot by themselves. That's the, can that's the candidate who does not have the, the line or the endorsement of the local party. We are the only state in the, system, in the country that has this system. And so I wanna give you some examples of what I mean by this, just so you can visually see this because it's a little hard under, under, understood, understand. I just grabbed a random sample ballot from uh, from uh, from Bergen County from this la from uh, this uh, uh, what's called this past this past election that happened uh, last month. Uh, this is from Maywood. I actually I'm not even sure where in Bergen County Maywood is, um, but this is what a uh, a primary ballot there looked like. If you guys voted, you would have seen in in election whether you were in Maywood or not. You probably saw something similar, and so you can see here. Uh, you, uh, let's say on the Democratic side, you can see the, it's the, the, the reason it's called the county line is because there is literally a line of candidates. In, in this case, column one, because they get preferential treatment. And so they go farthest to the left. In uh, the, uh, the, the, the Republican side, it's, it's a little bit complicated, <coughs> a little too complicated to explain why the Republican uh, line was in column B, or column, the second column here. But for all intents and purposes, when you look at this ballot, let's say you're Republican and you're going to vote, I would bet all the money in my pocket that you don't see Brian Levine's name on uh, there sitting in column one. You're going to look at Jack Chatterelli and his line of candidates. Or if you're a Democrat, you're not going to see Sandra Greenberg 
in column two, you're going to see Phil Murphy and his, his line, of, a line of candidates. This is by design. Uh, it's, it's specifically meant because that is visually where you are going to look. That's just how the human eyes work. Um, the, the worst case scenario is that you are uh, Harry Shortway, uh, who got stuck in column five by himself. Again, what's called Ballot Siberia. Almost certainly you're never going to see uh, Harry's name unless you're looking for it. If, even if you do see it, most voters are just going to think they, they probably don't know who Harry Shortway is. They probably know who Jack Chatterelli, Chatterelli is, or they may see someone else on that, on that line that they recognize, and they're just going to go up and down and vote for the entire line. And it's, it's unlikely that they are going to break off and vote for Sandra Greenberg, Harry Shortway, one of these other candidates. Um, I've had campaigns estimate to me that, the, uh, that having the line is worth anywhere, depends on what county you're in, but anywhere from 30 to 50% of the vote uh, uh, you, you can get just automatically by being, on, uh, by being on the line. So you can get up to 50%, which means you don't need to campaign at all if your name is on there just because when voters go in to vote, they're just going to see your name. They're not going to recognize anyone else's. And so I want to zoom in for a second on this, just so you can see exactly what I mean by the, the, the slogans. And you can see here that in Bergen County, the Democrats use the Democratic Committee of Bergen County. It's a pretty straightforward name. There are also certain rules in place that prevent anyone else, anyone else from using anything similar or too similar to that. Like you couldn't, Sandra Greenberg couldn't run under the slogan, the Democratic Committee. Or, the Dem or she couldn't run on Democrats of Bergen County because it would be considered too similar to that, to the other one, and they, they want to avoid voter confusion. And so there are a lot of times where candidates will try and use a similar name because they want you know, voters to see just Democratic something and vote for them. But there are a lot of restrictions on that that make it difficult for them. Now I want to show you what anywhere else's ballots look like. So this is, I just, I went to college in, uh, in Lancaster, Lancaster, Pennsylvania at Franklin and Marshall. So my first thought was just anywhere else's ballot was Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. So this is just uh, their ballot from this, their, their most recent primary election. Um, you can just see, you can see what, what the ballots look like here. And so in this example, they have, um, uh, let's, let's look at, for example, the, the judge of the superior court. You have Jill Beck, who's uh, running uh, from uh, Allegheny County, and you have someone else who's, uh, and Brian Neff, who's also running from Allegheny County, and then you have someone else who's running from Philadelphia County. It doesn't matter that the Allegheny counties, like the Allegheny counties don't get prioritized to be together. It, it's, just, it's just a random order. Um, uh, it's, yeah, it's just a random order. Some places do an alphabetical order, some do in reverse alphabetical, but it usually changes like ballot by ballot. So you may have two ballots, in a row, one is alphabetical, one's reverse alphabetical, others are just random. Um, but this is what most, in most places in the country, almost all, this is what their ballots look like. And so you don't get any additional benefit by being the, the party endorsed candidate. Um, you just, it's the luck of the draw, really. So I gave you some of these examples, the reg regular Democratic organization in the county. Sometimes they'll do things like Republicans for responsible uh, government. There's a legal mechanism to this in that uh, that allows the county committees to have the same names over and over again and makes it so no one else can grab them. Typically, they the, the, the they are incorporated as a little as a corporation entity that has that name. There's an act. There's a corporation called the regular regular Democratic Organization of Union County Incorporated, and if there's a company or an individual that has the same name unless you get their permission, you cannot use that slogan. Um, so if they legally own that slogan and no one else can use it without the county's permission. Um, every county, and this is important, every county has their own process to decide who gets the county line. In Union County, where I'm from, all the municipal chairs who are all elected by their local county committee members, they each get one vote. So whether you are Westfield with 30,000 people or Garwood with 4,000 people, each municipal chair gets one vote for a, let's say a legislative race or a congressional race. Uh, they each get one vote as to who is going to get the, uh, the, get, get the line for the, for the county. Um, in other counties, such as Morris County, 
the both the Democrats and the Republicans there give it put it up to a full vote among their county committee members. It could be a thousand members, and every single one of them gets a single vote. They use voting machines and everything to to decide who's going to get the line for whatever the race is. Um, there are other places like in Essex County and, a, and a, several counties in South Jersey where by under the rules, the county chair is the only person who decides. That, that's it, just a, a, a party of one, the county chair decides who is going to get that line in every single race. Um, so this system that was created to take the power out of the hands of these of the party bosses in, cer in certain places cements it in their, in their, in, in their control. Um, and yeah, and, and so in, in a lot of places, it's really worked the opposite way of what it was originally intended to do. So again, I, I mentioned this when we were looking at the ballots, but you know, a lot of the, 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 the line usually has someone that you, a name that you recognize at the top of it, whether it's uh, Phil Murphy, Chris Christie, John Corzine, John, Joe Biden, Donald Trump, Barack Obama, someone at the top whose name you recognize and your eye is gonna be drawn to that name. And you're going to look down the line and most people are just going to, like I said, are just going to go vote straight down. it. Um, that's just the way, uh, way it works. Because if you're not, and if you're not in line, then you end up, as I said, in ballot Siberia. Okay. There are other benefits to getting in line. Usually county parties will also give them, give them money. Uh, they will give them access to the voter databases, they'll give them organizations, like established organizations and other resources that they're not required to give to anybody else. For all these reasons, in most elections, if you, the general rule is that if you win the county line, you win the county's endorsement, you have won the primary election. In fact, in most places, there won't even be a primary election because you, because you have won the line and some other candidate has not. And that's why, just go back for a second, you can look at the thing. Most of these races, except for county clerk for the Democrats and governor for the Republicans and sheriff for the Republicans, there isn't actually a primary. It's one name. It's one candidate. I would bet that there were other candidates interested in running for all of those other positions, but because they didn't get the line, they decided, they realized it was not worth it to actually, you know, running campaign costs a lot of time and money, and it's, it's hard to do. Um, and it, it just takes a lot of investment. It's not worth doing if you're going to lose, if you know you're going to lose, which in most cases is what happens. Um, even if you have a well-funded uh, opposing candidate in a primary election, dollars to donuts in most of those races, they end up getting slaughtered. That's why there are so many primary races. Like I, I think of um, a good example of Steve Holt, who is the now very, very popular mayor of, of Jersey City. When he first started his political career, he ran, he ran for Congress back in 2004, 2004 against uh, Bob Menendez, now senator, at the time was a congressman. Menendez, obviously, he was a former mayor, had, had the line in, uh, in, um, for, the, for the congressional seat, and he ended up beating uh, uh, Steve Fulop, I believe it was 87% to 13%. Fulop had wasn't who he is now, but he didn't have nothing. But he still got the the crack kick out of him because, frankly, he didn't have the line. That's just the way it goes. Um, and to give you one more example, a specific example, this is a very recent. This is happening now as we speak. This is actually a client of mine, uh, Assemblyman Nick Chavarotti. Um, he's from Bayonne. He's been in office for a couple of years. Um, the Hudson County, the way the Hudson County Democratic Committee works, is that there are they basically give authority to the local mayors. Uh, to decide who is going to get the line. And they don't have to give a reason. And uh, so the mayor of Bayonne this time around just decided, I don't like Nick Chavarotti anymore. And actually, I, I shouldn't even say, it. I don't know what, we don't know what his reason is, but he just decided, I don't want Nick Chavarotti to be an assemblyman anymore. And so he took the line away and he gave it to someone else. Uh, and that's, that was it. Um, uh, Nick uh, put his, uh, he got collected signatures just in case, and just in case something changed, uh, collected the signatures for a petition to be put on the ballot. But when the time came, he decided, you know, it's not worth it. Despite being an assemblyman, despite having access to a lot of money and having good name recognition, I'm not going to beat the line. I'm not going to run. I'm not going to waste my time or anyone else's. And so he dropped out of the race. Um, and so that election, well, I, I, I mean, the primary happened in um, uh, in June, but in Bayonne, the, the Democrats are going to win. So 
Willie Sampson, who's the candidate that they picked, is going to be the next assemblyman from there, just because one guy who's elected, although he's not elected to the county, even to the county committee, decided he didn't want this assemblyman anymore. So I can't leave on quite so, so depressing of a note. Uh, so I want to talk just very briefly about how this system gets fixed. It's not going to be easy. Um, we, we, I'll say we have to fix it. It's something that, ha that has to be fixed. Um, it really, all the political power in New Jersey goes back to the line uh, and goes back to the party bosses who control the line. If you randomize the, the uh, ballot placement, it takes away that power entirely um, because it just, it puts all, all primary challengers on equal footing. You don't get any benefit by being the favorite of one guy. You have to be the favorite of the voters. Uh, it incentivizes, we, we see this in other, in other towns and other races, you saw it on that ballot from Lancaster, you, we, see, we see more competitive primaries, well, I say we see competitive primaries, plus more competitive primaries. It incentivizes better and more people to run for office, knowing that they have a fair shot at actually winning, whether they have a dollar to their name or a million dollars to their name. And that means that we get better elected officials uh, in the, uh, in the, uh, as a result of that. There is right now ongoing a federal lawsuit uh, against the state of New Jersey and the, the different county parties to get rid of the line, uh, basically saying that it's a violation of a lot of different federal, federal laws, uh, including the, the right to free speech, the right of free association, um, the right, rights, of voter, rights of voters. And so that lawsuit's ongoing. It, has, it started off, frankly, with not very good chance of succeeding, but since it was first filed, the Nick Chavrilotti example happened, and there have been a bunch of other examples throughout the state of the party bosses exerting their influence and sort of dictating the results. And so those are all become exhibits in the lawsuit, and it's the, the chances of it have gotten significantly, significantly better. That's ongoing right now. I'm not involved in the case, although I'm obviously watching it, um, but that's ongoing. Um, there are efforts to lobby the state legislature to change the, uh, the, the, uh, the ballot design uh, just like there were back in the early 1900s. Uh, and so th that's ongoing uh, too. So I knew you guys had Josh Gottheimer uh, speak, uh, speak, I guess it was last week. I would imagine you will have other uh, elected officials speak. This is definitely something that you should ask them all about. Um, it's a good question to them whether or not they're going to support this or not. Um, it obviously benefits them, but a lot, a lot, you'd be surprised at how many elected officials are confident that they will still be able to win and do want to make it a fair system for, for others. Um, and so we, there are there are there are a lot of quiet supporters out there. Um, I believe Loretta Weinberg is is uh, um, who I think represents you guys is one of the biggest supporters of it. Um, so I do think it is a matter of time before it happens, but it's something that needs active active lobbying. Um, and so I just want to leave you with the thought that a government is not necessarily democratic just because you have voting. There is if you don't have a meaningful choice, it's not much of a dem democracy. And so that's, I think, what the, what the heart of voter suppression is. It take, the voter suppression takes a lot of forms, whether it's physically denying uh, individuals access to the ballot, uh, to the machines, but I think at a more fundamental level, it comes to their vote not mattering anyway. Um, and so that's, New Jersey has one of the, the worst systems for this, and so that's why I wanted to discuss it with you guys tonight. Um, and so with that, I, I wanted to open up the questions. It could be about this. It could be about anything you guys want, whether it's New Jersey state or federal. You want to talk about voter suppression, whatever it is you guys want to do, we can we can talk about it. So with that, I'm going to stop the screen share so you guys can just see me and um, I'll open it up. Great, Scott. Uh, thank you. I'll just jump in here for a quick second. Um, uh, if anybody's got any questions, uh, Scott had a lot of uh, detail that maybe many of us were unaware of. But feel free to raise your hand and I'll call on you to keep it organized or send, uh, send me a text, uh, a, a chat with your question, and I'll read it out for Scott to address. But thanks a lot, Scott. That was uh, well prepared and you obviously are well informed on what's going on in the uh, granular uh, detail that I think many of us may not be aware of. Well, I mean, what do you guys got? Stacy, and then you have to unmute too. <laughs> Hi, um, I was wondering, what do you think of the ranked choice voting in, that they're doing in New York City right now? It seems to me that it is a fairer system 
I'd like your opinion of it. And I'd also like to know, how did they pass it? Did they have a Democratic majority in the state? Or who passed it? You mean ranked choice voting? Yes. Yeah, so um, New York is not the first, uh, uh, for, actually New York City is not the, not the first place to, to, to do this. I believe they use it in Maine and I think some places in Colorado use it. Um, there are a couple places that, 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 have, that have done it. It's, it's much more common in other, um, in other countries than it is in the United States. Ranked choice voting, so I like back up for a sec, for those of you who don't know where ranked choice voting is, in, in the way we vote, you get essentially one, one choice. So if you have, let's say five people who are running for governor, uh, you choose one uh, because there's only one seat available. With ranked choice voting, you get to rank your choices. You could say, these are there are five candidates. This is the order in which I like them. And so as you need, you need uh, candidates need to get a majority of the vote to win. And so uh, unless a candidate gets a majority on the first called go around, when they first count all the everyone's first choices, they then bump off uh, everyone's bottom choices. And then if your bottom choice, well, if, if the person who gets, got, got um, bumped off is your top choice, then it goes down to your second choice and then it's, and so on and so on until someone gets a majority of, of the vote. It is a very good idea in theory. Um, there are two, well, New York City is probably the, one of the last places I would have picked to try it out publicly because they have one of the worst run boards of election in the entire country. Honestly, one of the worst uh, run boards of election probably in, in the world. It's just, uh, they're just, I don't know, just, other than they're a bunch of idiots, they just don't know how to run an election and it just takes them weeks to do it, bad at it. I can't say enough of that how often New York is. But in any case, um, it's a good idea in theory. The, the big problem with it is one, you need to have a meaningful choice. So you need to have actual choices, which they obviously did in New York in this past one. The problem though is most voters are fairly, and I'm saying this very broadly, fairly uninformed in terms of they may know a lot about uh, one candidate or two candidates. It's rare, I think, for voters to know the details of five candidates or for there even to be enough meaningful difference between the five of them to, I'll call, to meaningfully rank them, to be able to distinguish between them. I think it's better than what we have now. I'll say that for sure. If for no other reason than it encourages other people to run uh, and better candidates to run and gives people a fair shot. Um, I think uh, if, we're, if we are going to do that and there's been a big effort in New, in New Jersey uh, recently to, to adopt a similar system, it needs to be matched with more voter education. Um, we probably need more uh, to have more taxpayer funded elections. So more candidates have access to the money to educate voters about their platforms and, and what they're like. Um, I, think it can, I think it can work, but I don't think it can work if it's done without any other changes to the system. Does that make sense? Yeah. And New York City, to, to answer the last party question, it was, that was done um, by the, the council, uh, the, the, essentially the city council in, in New York, uh, in New York City, as to uh, adopting it there. But it could be done, uh, it, could, it could be done here. Uh, well, I would say it would have to be done by the, by the state legislature in New Jersey. Um, we don't have a separate system like New York City does, where it would, it would have to come from them. Can I ask you one more question? Course, yeah. Uh, behind you, there's a black and white sketch of a woman. And I was wondering, is that uh, Barbara? Or... No, that's Shirley, that's Shirley Chisholm. I don't know Shirley Chisholm. Yeah, yeah. Shirley, that's Shirley Chisholm. She's a, she's a, she's a favorite of mine. Uh, but no, yeah. yeah. That's, that's the end of my personal question. Fair enough. What else you guys got? Okay, hang on one second here. Uh, Joe, well, okay, Joe's got a question. I don't know which Joe exactly, but uh, Joe? This is uh, yeah, Joe here. Landau. This is Joe Landau. Oh, Thank I'm you. sorry, Joe. No problem. I, I just, uh, um, uh, considering county leaders uh, setting up the slate in uh, on the ballot, um, it, it sounds uh, uh, nefarious, but if that was not the case, in other words, if it was left open to a random ballot, uh, um, would it not uh, uh, 
be probable that uh, the candidate with the most money, uh, in other words, the more the more a PR you can buy, would almost automatically win in a case where there was randomized, um, 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 uh, you know, choices without county leaders or county democratic machines or whatever they are making some choices to uh, for the slate. That's a, that's a great question, and the answer is that in I don't want to say you, I think you were saying that in in all in almost all circumstances they would they would win. In most circumstances they would they would they would still win, um, because you know as I said they, they can afford to get their name out and more voters recognize the name when they go into vote. But if if it's going from a ninety nine percent chance that the person who's selected by the by the the county party wins to let's say even a 65 percent i'm making up a number here but let's say 65 percent chance that's a significant increase in the odds for for another candidate to uh, to upset them and to and to win um and so that that is definitely i mean that that's that would could, could be a, a significant increase you also get a more likely uh chance that there will be multiple candidates with a lot of money that, that get in the race um like we saw in new york there were plenty of candidates uh that that with with a lot of money behind them that were able to get in um, I also want to clarify, you know, I should have, I should have put this in the presentation. It's, it's not all <sighs> necessarily bad that the, that the county party can choose the, the candidate. There is some value in it in the sense of typically the people who are the county committee members are, again, I'm speaking very broadly here, typically more informed about who the potential candidates are. They're more involved in, in the, like on the ground politics. Um, and so when, when the choice is actually left up to the county committee, there is some value in allowing the people who are at, most actively involved in the party to choose who is going to represent them in the general election. The only places where that really happens, I mean, there, there are a couple counties, like I guess I mentioned uh, Morris County, um, I think Bergen County, at least the Democrats have a similar system where it's a true open vote uh, among all of the county committee members. So you have like a thousand people voting on who the, 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 the representatives are gonna be. There's some value in that. Um, I don't think it's as good as all the voters being able to choose, but it, there is some value. So I just, your question just reminded me of that. And uh, um, so I just wanna, I guess, address that. But the most, the candidate with the most money will still probably win most of the time, yes. Uh, can I can I just add uh, something to my question? I mean, basically, people that work for Democratic committees and um, uh, not just Democratic Republican committees, et cetera, are usually people committed to some form of public service. They're not in most instances. They are not the wealthy. They are not the the people that have uh, you know political access to grind necessarily. I mean, there, there is corruption there, but I'm just saying that if you look at who does the selection and you want it to be uh, done in a, in a way that um, removes some of the aspects of uh, mega money making the decisions or dark money or whatever it is, what you call it, shouldn't there be, I mean, you're, you're advocating for getting rid of essentially a system that allows a, a public servants in one form or another to do something democratically at the lowest level of, uh, you know, the election process. And, uh, you know, I don't, all I'm saying is there are benefits to this thing and not just negative things related to how those, uh, those uh, activities happen. Yep, that's fair enough. And I, I think that's definitely true is in the places where those men, those individuals actually have a say. Unfortunately, there are of the 21 counties, two parties on both sides. There, are, the majority of them, in the majority of them, they don't, they don't have a say. But I agree for the for those places that do have it, uh, it's it's better than than those other counties. Um, Matt, thanks, Howard, and uh, thanks, Scott, for uh, for joining us tonight. Um, you know, as we think about things that really take away a meaningful choice in voting, you know, having the vote, but not really having the mo me vote mean something. Certainly the county line in New Jersey is a big issue. Thinking around the country a little bit more uh, gerrymandering 
is another you know, thing that, that seriously comes into play that in, in so many places make the outcome of an election predetermined or make the, the at the very least make the primary the only thing that really matters um, in those districts. Um, and then a couple of years back, the Supreme Court came back and basically said, yeah, sure, that is a political thing. There's no problem with that, at least as it stands right now. So, you know, my question is, um, you know, if, you know, if you perceive, uh, you know, gerrymandering as a threat to meaningful choice, and if so, given that Supreme Court uh, decision, where does that leave us in terms of recourse, in terms of fixing it? Uh, that's, yeah, that's not a good. That's not a good question. It's not as big a problem in New Jersey, although it it, it can be in certain in certain areas. Um, it's not as big a problem in New Jersey, but um, yeah, I I mean I I think it's the, it presents the same kind of problem that things like line do in the sense of removing meaningful choice from voters, um, and that's really when that's that's the purpose in having in having a democracy is that you have a meaningful choice of who is going to represent you. In a lot of places in the country, in, in there, I would say most places in the country, you don't really have much of a choice because the Democrats always going to win, or the Republicans always going to win, and wherever wherever it is. And if you're not even, I mean, and so that 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 like like I was saying, r removes any meaningful choice. The primary issue with it is that it comes from because I'll call Congress is deadlocked uh, uh, on uh, on this right now and their ability to provide um, across the board requirements for how states do this is, is limited right now. It means that each state is on its own for how they, uh, how they decide what districts are going to look like. Um, and just to back up for a second, let's try to clarify this. When, when Matt's referring to gerrymandering, he's referring to, the, to how, districts are, uh, how election districts are chosen in each state. Um, you know, you're, I'm not sure what uh, legislative district you guys are in, or uh, a, or the, the congressional districts that you're in, but all that, the borders of all that, have to be chosen by someone or something. And so in New Jersey, we have this bipartisan commission that that decides it every 10 years uh, after the census results come out. Um, some states have partisan commissions, some states have nonpartisan commissions, some states get a bunch of statistical nerds in a room and they figure it out, uh, figure out what's the fairest system. Uh, other places, uh, I think majority of places do. Actually, I shouldn't say it's a majority. I'm not sure how many it is. Um, I think most though do um, the, essentially the legislature, which is typically dominated by one political party, will choose. Some states have their the state Supreme Court justices choose uh, what, what the districts are gonna look like. And so you have totally different systems all across the board, some fairer than others. You have places like um, uh, North Carolina, uh, Minnesota, uh, Arizona's had problems with it. Uh, Georgia's had a lot of problems with it. Uh, Texas, where you have these districts that are shaped in, uh, I'll call them, I'll call them ridiculous shape. There's, there's one district that's like the, I think it's called like the, 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 go the goofy kicking Donald district or something. Cause it, the district literally looks like, uh, uh um, like goofy from like the, the, like the cartoon kicking Donald duck or something. Like it's just shaped like the outline of that. Um, uh, so there are like there are all these weird shaped districts that um, happen throughout the throughout the country. And so all that's right now left with the state legislatures. And so really, until Congress does something, it's really up to the individual voters in each of those states to require that their legislature a change that they change their system. Some of it is up to the lawyers. Uh, there have been lawsuits going in in most of those states that have significant problems with this, uh, and they, they have lawsuits going back decades. I know that they're. I know of um, in uh, New Jersey, they're, they're, they have them every 10 years too, uh, lawsuits to try and get more fair districts. Um, so that really that's until Congress can act, it's really up to the legislature, I'll call it the legislatures and the lawyers to, to, to fix. Um, so if you know people in other, in, other, in other states that have gerrymandered uh, districts, it's really on them to, to uh, go to their representatives and demand they do something about it. Not really satisfying answer, but best we got for now. Evan? Hey, Scott, this is great. Thanks so much for your time. I have to apologize. I do have to drop in a few minutes for a work call, but I have to ask, this was fairly sobering in terms of just how bad the system is in New Jersey. 
I'm not sure I have a whole lot of faith in, in sort of our politicians fixing this. Has there any discussion or any attempts to sort of sue the state of New Jersey, you know, for constitutional infirmity, either by someone who had a run on, you know, ballot side barrier or as a voter who maybe felt like they were denied the franchise to vote by virtue of how bad it is? I mean, that Bayonne example you gave, basically, because Bayonne is, you know, is one, you know, like many places, is a one party town, it's Democrats one person decided who the assembly was going to be in, in effect. And that to me just sounds like an abridgment of the right to vote. But I don't know if there's been any, I'd be interested to hear your view of A, if that's ever been tried and, and B, if, you know, what the likelihood of something like that actually succeeding would be. Yeah, so it's an interesting question. Yes, there is a lawsuit, there's a federal lawsuit going on right now. When this first happened, when it first was passed back in the 20s, uh, there were a bunch of lawsuits over how it would work, but no one really questioned whether or not it was legal or mm -hmm. not. Uh, and so the judges never were faced with that question really until now. Um, that lawsuit, like I mentioned this before, the lawsuit is, um, it has, a, I would say, a fairly decent chance of, of succeeding. Um, it's in the district court in New Jersey right now. Um, I think we're, we're probably in the next year, we'll probably get some sort of answer as to the legality of it. But I don't want to make it sound totally bleak because there has been a, I'll say for this, it was, it was passed, I think it was 1923 that this law was first passed. Mm -hmm. So for the first 80 years of it, 90 years even of it, there was really not much of an effort except one-off uh, uh, things to try and uh, fix this. In the last of all five years, there has been significant progress in getting people elected to the legislature who are opposed to the, to the system line. And so there is a growing number of people in the legislature who are uh, who are working to, you know, lobby others and, and get rid of it. I do think it is a matter of time before it will eventually be uh, 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 replaced with something else. I, re I really do believe that just the way New Jersey tends to work with these spurts of, I'll call them progressive changes to make them make the laws more voter friendly. Um, I think it's a matter of time. I would guess that, that it happens before the decade is out. Um, but it's not just going to happen just because these kinds of things tend to happen. It's only going to happen because there there are actual efforts right now to to, to lobby and get new people in there. Because it doesn't always work. Like I said, ninety nine percent of the time, it, it the the line chooses who's going to be there. But there's still the one percent chance. Uh, there's still the one percent time that it doesn't happen. And so there are people who make it in who are opposed to it. Um, and I do like I said, I do think it is. If we keep working at it, it is a matter of time before uh, before it eventually is eradicated. Hopefully sooner, but with this lawsuit, that, that, that's mm -hmm. um, that's what I'm hoping for. But if not, by by the by the legislature, is there I, any opportunity? Well, I, I was just, I was just gonna ask: Is there any opportunity for citizens to take it into their hands and take it as a petition to a, a voter question? Sure, there could be a, there could be a a, a voter led constitutional amendment uh, to to change it, but the uh, the requirements to get get something it's it's you know, now it's now it's too late to get something on the on the ballot on the on the statewide ballot for November. Um, it's a it's a big process to get and to get that kind of get something like that put as a constitutional question, um, but it's absolutely something that, that voters could do. I don't know that there's been that much discussion of it, but there probably should be. A lot more than 580 signatures. Yes, a lot more than that. Gloria. Yeah, could I ask um, a question? Uh, okay, go to Scott. Um, I, I'm not in this district, but something happened between Valerie Huttle and Gordon Johnson. Have, did you follow that? Yep. Yeah. It seemed they both were pretty much equal in in their politics. Um, and first, uh, Loretta Weinberger, she didn't want to come out for either one. And then she came out for Gordon. So I'm not sure what they were running for. What assembly? Or? They they were running for the state senate. They, they were actually running, yeah. they were running to they're running to replace uh, uh, Loretta Weinberg, who's uh, stepping down at the end of this term. Right for state senate. Uh, right. And um, so I don't know what happened there. Uh, you know they're pretty yeah. much like equal. You I don't know. I hate to say you think it was because he's black or you know I don't know. They want to get right. have more equality or you know racial equity or yeah. So that, that's a that's a really good example. Um. So both so both uh, Valerie uh, Huddle and uh, um, Gordon Johnson are both were both assemblymen in the same in the same district. So they were you know on, on they they worked together. Or Adam Weinberg was the state senator. She decided to retire, and so both of them decided that they want to run for her state senate seat. Um. 
the county party chose uh, uh, Gordon Johnson to, to run uh, w uh, w under the county line. Um, and it's actually a really good example because uh, of the power of the power of the line, uh, because uh, Valerie Huddle decided she wanted to run anyway, despite despite who the county had endorsed, despite not having a line. They both had called a lot of money behind them, um, and we're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars. There were a lot of a lot of interest groups that were uh, in in the race on both sides. I think they were fairly even in terms of uh, money and endorsements and things like that. Um, and then Gordon Johnson just kicked the crap out of Valerie Huddle on election day this past primary. Um, some would argue that, it, that they thought that he was a better candidate. I would argue that it was because of the power of the line that when people went, went, went to vote, they saw Phil Murphy, saw Gordon Johnson right, uh, right beneath him and they just voted down the line and they mm. didn't see Valerie Huddle over there. That's my opinion on it. Obviously other people will have a different opinion, mm. but I think given that they are both fairly well known, they both had a lot of money behind them and the, the one different, the one major, major difference is one of them had the line and the other didn't. That's why I ascribe it to, but like I said, other, other people will disagree about that. But that's, that's another good example of the power of line, even if you do have a lot of money behind you. Hmm. Great. Any uh, last questions? Obviously, the people whose video is not on, I can't see if your hand gets raised. Well, great, Scott. Uh, this was uh, thought provoking and uh, uh, informative to us all. And um, it's Hopefully not too depressing. Um, no, probably not. There's always daylight. But uh, fortunately, we have a lot of people that are engaged this way. And uh, thank you for taking the time. And uh, I think we have your contact information. So if another question should come up, um, maybe we could reach out to you, but um, we certainly appreciate uh, the whole presentation and I hope Thank everybody you. enjoyed yeah. it. Thank you. Very, very enlightening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Great, Scott. Thanks a lot. And this will be on our uh, YouTube channel uh, recorded. Uh, is that okay, Scott? Yeah. Fine. Okay. Just, just want to make sure. Uh, great. Oops. Okay, everybody. Thanks a lot.